right. Hey, first off, it's great to see you because I rarely get to see you, even though you live almost next door to me. But it is great to finally meet you, Russell. It's been it's weird because I think I've already known you for a few years. Yes, yet we've it's never been met a while, Tim. in Wait, person. You've but... never met Russell? No, not once. Only, only virtually. virtually. Now, only virtually, not in reality. Real. So, anyways, I guess the real big question that probably most people would want to ask you is how have things changed in the Donbass, you know, since the actual special military operation started? Because you're the person who's been there all these years through all of this from the very beginning, who put their life on the line, especially at the beginning, to make sure that the Donbass got to come home. And now the Donbass is home, at least according to TV screens in Moscow. So yeah. how have things changed, man? Well, uh, you know, the first thing that everybody needs to always remember is this war didn't start in February of 2022. It started in early 2014. Mm -hmm. I came to Donetsk in uh, December of 2014 to join the army and to defend the people of Donbass and to, uh, as I said back then, punish the punishers. Mm -hmm. And I did that. I served a year in the DPR army. Uh, as a member of Vostok, as a member of Hans Spetsnaz Battalion, and also as the uh, MVD VV, which is like the uh, the uh, military police, uh, Avdiivka, Donbass Front, uh, Donetsk Airport, uh, Spartak, uh, Iznovata, and you know it's been a real war this whole time. I mean, a real war in the sense of we've been fighting against tanks, heavy artillery, even airstrikes, and um, so it's been a real war for eight years, not just since uh, the beginning of this year. Mm -hmm. At the beginning of this year, um, and people need to understand too, that the reason that the Russians came in is because the Ukrainian army had amassed mm -hmm. uh, 120,000 troops along the Donbass front, which was about 200 miles. So 120,000 soldiers, artillery, mm -hmm. tanks, everything, uh, against uh, the people's uh, militia. DPR uh, defenders, and, uh, you know, we were way outnumbered. They were getting ready to come in. They were going to make a major assault. Uh, the, the Donbass front is literally on the city limits of the main uh, cities of the of Donbass, which is uh, Lugansk, Donetsk, Gorlovka, Makievka. And so, I mean, from the center of Donetsk, it's like 10 miles to the front line, less. And so they were getting ready. They had prepared. They had the intentions. They had the plans. Uh, and Russia knew about it. So they knew that if the Ukrainian army was able to make it halfway into the city, you know, and I mean, Donetsk is a city of a million people, yeah. you know, then that would have negated, it would have been urban warfare and it would have negated the main military advantages that Russia has, which is its air power, its uh, missile power, and its artillery. Because when you're surrounded by civilians, you can't use those weapons. Mm -hmm. And just as the uh, Ukrainian Azov Nazis did in Mariupol, they had as a strategic tactic, they were going to use human human shields. Yeah. You know, so um, so Russia made the right move. They they had no other choice but to come in at the beginning of uh, or the end of February. They did. They saved tens of thousands, at least, of, of civilian lives by doing so. And, uh, you know, it really it upped the war. It's made it's the, the war is harder for everybody now. But, you know, it was inevitable. It was inescapable. And we thank well, Russia for what they did. Well, one thing, why did it take them so long? Because if it took them sort of eight years to prepare, and even then, you know, Russia struck first, mm -hmm. why did it take so long? They amassed 120,000 guys in what? They mm -hmm. sort of were waiting for a particular time? Well, they, I mean, opportunity the, the Ukrainians or? had a specific attack plan. And uh. they were coming in and, you know, uh, it was the first week of March was the planned start date for this offensive you know, it's the weather's changing. It's like, I mean, and really the weather wouldn't have been that much of a uh, consideration because, you know, it's it's not like they have to go through the mud in the fields mm -hmm. because they're coming straight in on the main roads, you know. Yeah, yeah. So, I mean, Russia for eight years tried to make a diplomatic solution, tried to make the peaceful, least destructive solution. And when it became, when they understood that that was absolutely impossible, they did what they had to do. Mm -hmm. And I mean, and... You know, they hadn't planned on doing it that way, but they had to. And so, I mean, and mistakes were made. You know, they, they bit off more than they could chew in the beginning. 
They were trying to make an assault force with less than one to one when military principles say that you need, you know, three to five to one yeah. in order to attack a defending force. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, they did well. They made some mistakes, but now uh, the uh, the new general um, Surovikin, mm -hmm. uh, he's he's my kind of guy. You know, uh, <laughs> anybody anybody that Alexander Sladkov likes, Alexander Khodorkovsky likes, mm -hmm. and uh, um, Kadyrov likes, Ramzan Kadyrov likes, yeah. I like him too. Oh, <laughs> that's pretty simple. Well, then let's go back a little bit to this, uh, the phase sort of before the uh, special military operation started. One thing that I'm still curious is, is for all those years, you guys were sort of stuck in this limbo of being technically inside Ukraine, but technically broken away at the same time. And although Russia and Moscow is sympathetic, you know, I'm sure you heard for years the disappointing sort of rhetoric of like, well, let's follow the Minsk Accords, which would have shoved you guys mm -hmm. back into Ukraine under certain terms. But anyways, you're stuck in this nether world, okay? Uh, in a legal sense, in terms of your borders to a degree. Like, how did people for eight years, I mean, even just have a job and make an income and eat? And how has that changed since the special military operation? Well, um, first of all, the people of Donbass are among the most bravest uh, in the world. You know, what they've been through for the last eight years has been really rough. You know, most people can't even imagine what it's been. Um, and they just, I mean, basically, you just get used to it. I mean, when I got off the bus in Donetsk on the 7th of December 2014, you know, I immediately heard heavy artillery shelling. And I mean, not, not like bang, but like, yeah. you know, constant. And I'm there and there's like, you know, moms pushing their babies in strollers. There's the old ladies uh, feeding the birds or something. Mm. And they're just like, no big deal, you know. So I just followed their lead. You know, these people are so brave. They're dedicated. I mean, they don't really have any choice, you know, because they understand that, you know, the people that are attacking them are genuine Nazis who will come in and commit genocide against mm -hmm. them if they surrender. You know, the, the guys along the, the front that have been defending it for eight years, they're DPR soldiers. They have their homes and their families behind them. So, you know, they never retreat. I mean, uh, Gierkin, Strelkov, he retreated from Slavyansk in 2014 in the summer. Mm -hmm. Since then, I mean, and he was a Russian. He wasn't from Donbass, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but since then, we've never stepped one step back. The Vostok Battalion, my battalion, you know, our motto, Tolka period neadin shag nazad, only mm -hmm. forward, not one step back. And we have never, ever, you know, I mean, except under orders from the Russians since this operation yeah, yeah, began, yeah. we have never, ever retreated from a position or abandoned any, any villages or people or anything like that because there are people, you know, so... Since the operation started, things got a lot more heavier, a lot more harder. The Ukraps have been uh, bombing our um, our city, civilian mm -hmm. areas. Uh, there's really, you know, some intentional, you know, mass murder, terrorist attacks, mm -hmm. and um, so it's it's gotten tougher. But you know, we we have no choice. We're going to defend ourselves. We're not giving up our land. Now it's Russian land. We hope that the uh, Russians will continue to support us, we'll regain the military initiative, and uh, let's go to Kiev. Well, now, so the guys you served with or people you know in the region, so right now, uh, Russia and the Donbass forces and Wagner and all these guys have been able to push forwards a lot. Have they revealed any sort of secrets about what the Ukrainians were up to? Quite a um, bit, in fact. You know, I mean, uh, first of all, I mean, the first one of the first places they took was the uh, Gostomel Air Base uh, outside of Kiev. Uh, there's uh, very strong evidence that they found a dirty nuclear dirty bomb there. Uh, there's there's a couple of dozen wow. biological labs that were owned and run by the U.S. Department of Defense. Uh, that the, it was on Ukrainian territory, but Ukrainians had not only no say in it, they had no idea what was going on there. Mm -hmm. This yeah. was. These were creating biological weapons that were designed against uh, Slavic DNA. They, mm -hmm. they were collecting Slavic DNA and trying to create a virus that would specifically go against that. They were studying how to uh, spread uh, disease by uh, migratory birds that would fly, mm -hmm. you know, like from Crimea into Russia in the summer or something like that. I mean, some real definite war crimes. 
Um, so there's been a lot. I mean, and this isn't like, uh, you know, uh, something that I read off of, you know, some blogger on the Internet or something. I mean, Victoria Newland has, in fact, uh, admitted that there were bio, you know, she says, oh, bio research study facilities. research. Yeah. But she's admitted they were there. And it was, I mean, there, and the Russians have the evidence and the paperwork to back this up, you know. And eventually, if there's ever an honest court somewhere or the UN ever becomes, you know, honest or anything like that, mm. they will have the evidence to back that up. Good luck. Uh, well, yeah. <laughs> well, John, do you think yeah. that they might have been doing the same thing in China then? Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, look, there's there's been uh, there's been strong evidence that suggests that uh, that virus yeah was actually designed in the United States mm -hmm. and experimentation in China, mm -hmm. and then probably just carelessness well, got yeah. loose. Because, like, I just want to kind of point out that uh, when we look across the world, we have the West and the rest, and for the rest, there haven't been much about that particular disease. It kind of came, they'd had some questionable measures to deal with it, but it all sort of blew over pretty quickly, but not in China. And that makes me kind of think that maybe in China, it's a lot more uh, effective on purpose. But anyways, that's just kind of the way I see things. But so anyways, what is the, the mood then, uh, Russell, in, you know, in the Donbass? Is this when, you know, these, uh, on television in Moscow, they showed, you know, that uh, we're going to have uh, the, the regions come back to Russia, four new states, to put it in American terms. We have Putin standing there with the four leaders of the four uh, regions, everyone shaking hands and happy. It was the same mood, you know, in the Donbass, or people kind of just like, this is more of the same, political show, I still hear bombs exploding. You know. um, uh, it, was, uh, it was both to a certain degree. I mean, I voted in the referendum. I voted to allow Russia to join the Donetsk People's Republic, mm -hmm. you know, and uh, it was so, I mean, but, you know, the only thing that matters is winning this war. That's the only thing that matters. Mm -hmm. There was a lot of people that thought, you know, this is just more, uh, you know, PR or whatever. You know, as long as the people are still getting massacred, you know, in the Donbass cities, you know, it doesn't matter what flag is flying mm -hmm. above the place where all the people get killed. You know, it's yeah. it's who's, you know, who's got the guns, who's controlling the land and who's protecting the people. That's what counts for us. And we are deeply grateful to Vladimir Putin, the Russian people, the Russian military, Wagner, the Chechen heroes that have come in mm. and uh, they're doing a great job. They're doing, the soldiers on the ground are magnificent. The generals, you know, strategic mistakes were made. That's getting corrected now. Uh, I do believe that uh, they had a very difficult job at the beginning. So, you know, I'm not saying that they were, you know, complete idiots or that, you know, whatever like that. But, you know, we have to regain the military initiative. My biggest concern right now is that, you know, NATO is using up, they're, they're throwing so much weapons at Ukraine that are yeah. getting stolen and mm -hmm. diverted. They're getting blown up by our guys. Yeah. Um, so the, can, there's no way that either Ukraine or NATO can beat Russia in a conventional war, either in Ukraine or in Europe. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And everybody knows that, you know. So my fear is that the plan from the West is for them to set off a false flag nuclear weapon, tactical nuke mm -hmm. on Ukrainian held territory and then blame it on Russia and then use that as an excuse for NATO to unleash nukes against Russia. And, you know, I mean, from there, it's Pandora's box and mm, it's the end can't, of everything. can't put them back in the box, you know. So yeah. that's a real concern. The more that Russia can maintain the military initiative, show that it's winning conventionally, mm -hmm. then, you know, I mean, if, if Russia's winning conventionally, there's no, you know, no reasonable person will believe that they would use a nuke if they're already winning, you know? Mm -hmm. So yeah. that's the best protection against that false flag, which, I mean, the false flags of, of NATO and the West are legion and well-known and well-documented. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So if Especially we can Especially in 2001. <laughs> exactly, exactly, man. And, uh, you know, you brought you brought up a good point about uh, all these weapons being stolen. Um, I can't remember where I heard it from, but um, in Germany, they just arrested somebody with a Stinger missile. <laughs> yeah, they they they, uh, they yeah. arrested somebody in yeah. Alaska. 
Um, with an in-law. Yeah. You know, Anti-tank rocket. Yeah. Yeah. And also, I, I believe, where, didn't Russia actually buy to NATO something? I think I'll say APCs from, like, corrupt people that were on the Ukrainian side. Dude. Basically, they started buying NATO equipment from them to sort of, you know, analyze it and take they, a look at it. They've and bought that. a HIMARS. A HIMARS, wow. And, <laughs> and the ammunition for 900000 yeah. from corrupt Ukrainians, yeah. That's actually probably a really good price for that. That's a great deal. Yeah, that's a great deal. 900000 Well, I mean, the guy that sold it just became almost a millionaire, and, I mean, he didn't pay for it. So, uh, just so you guys know, 900000 was rubles. Dollars. 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 Oh, dollars. dollars. Okay. Okay. But still, I don't know how much would a HIMARS system cost. That's something I'm not very good at. It's probably probably four or five million at least, you know. And, I mean, the rockets are like... 300,000 each, you know, I mean. Jesus hmm. Christ. And also, it's pretty easy. Uh, maybe people who are watching this don't really understand that uh, it's also very easy f- to sort of defect from one side to the other because no matter what they say, everyone speaks Russian. Uh, so mm. it's easy once you get that tank to sell it off. But that's here's, that's actually an interesting uh, moment. How many traitors have been discovered in the Donbass since the beginning of this? Uh, of course, in every war, there's traitors on both sides. You know, spies like that. Uh, I mean, you know, there's, uh, you know, I mean, the guys who killed Zaharchenko and Givy and Motorola, they also, uh, you know, I mean, they had help, you know, in Donetsk mm-hmm. as well. You know, they couldn't have done it all by themselves. Um, I mean, so there's always traitors on each side. Um, our uh, intelligence services are intelligent. Mm-hmm. Uh, <laughs> you don't want to get on their bad side at all. Oh, and, no. uh, you know, they've, you know, they've rooted out a lot of evil. They've prevented a lot of terrible things from happening, both in Donbass and in Russia, you know, and I give them great respect for that. Wow. Well, if anyone from the FSB is watching, we appreciate your work as well. So, Indeed. But one thing is, um, I was just reading before I actually came here on the, the subway, was there's an article for, uh, that was on Lou Rockwell that said that NATO actually did some exercises in France where they sort of changed the names around of, like, what's Russia. They called Russia something like Mercury and Moscow, like Mercuria, Mercuriuskva or something mm-hmm. like that. Basically, they did a simulation of sort of, like, attacking the Crimea and this, that, and the other. And they sort of had the idea that uh, NATO was actually planning to, when Kiev attacked to simultaneously do like some sort of landing. Do you think that there's any possibility that that was true or is that just sort of like internet fantasy? Well, I think, uh, I mean, and I have uh, a lot of respect for Lou Rockwell. He's a smart guy. Um, I think that their plan was to come in over land because the thing is, you know, with the anti-ship missiles uh, that, that, uh, you know, major countries have today, you know, amphibious landings Mm -hmm. are... A thing of the past because once you know a country sees that there is you know a major amphibious force coming you know that they're, they're not going to wait until it hits the beach man they mm-hmm. can because they can pop it i mean just like uh near the zaporozhia nuclear power plant you know the uh, uh right on the front lines mm-hmm. there's a big reservoir there like a giant lake and on one side is uh U- russian controlled and the other side is ukrainian controlled mm-hmm. and they've tried several times like even with like, I don't know, 30 different like, you know, fast boats um, Mm -hmm. to come across and make a landing. And they just, they get popped uh, right there uh, while they're still on the water. Jesus. It's hard to swim with a, uh, you know, a bulletproof vest and a helmet and boots and... uh, Oh, one part is part of a military reality show. Yeah, it's hard to swim with a gun. Uh, I never experienced yeah. an experience I never want to repeat. Um, but that's pretty crazy. And I think one of the things, too, is, uh, again, maybe I'm gullible because I've never been in the military, except for that stupid reality show. But I, I've been told that one of the reasons why Iran has such nice drones is because they were sort of preparing for the United States to maybe encircle them and just drone the hell out of the entire, like, Navy or landing craft. Mm, and that's why they have so many. Well, you know, one thing that's also... Uh, one of the reasons I'm sure that they have such excellent equipment is they have uh, um, taken over several American drones uh, all the way mm. up to yeah, the Reaper. Like, yeah, the Reaper, and they landed it themselves. So they reversed engineered. So they got a lot. I mean, and the, the Iranians are very good with uh, electronic warfare, mm. and which is how they were able to overtake, uh, hack that Reaper and bring it down. There's a couple of other ones too. And, you know, and so they basically reverse engineered them. So they got a lot of, uh, you know, 
leaps forward in technology just from uh, Uncle Sam. Nice. Well, now that you're uh, sort of part of uh, Russia proper there, has anything changed like in terms of the food at the stores? Has banking gotten easier? The, maybe the internet, you know? Has there sort of been a movement of Russian businesses and services that we get to enjoy it's, here? It's starting, or? but it hasn't gotten there yet. I mean, mm -hmm. one thing that has happened, as has happened pretty much all over the world, is we've seen a significant price rise in food. Um, the, uh, I mean, fuel is still about the same, which is much better than much, much better than in Europe and even better than the States. Um, I think uh, we're paying about uh, three bucks a gallon for 95 octane uh, mm -hmm. in, in Donetsk, which is, I mean, I see it like, you know, I mean, they don't wait, even have wait, 95 in the States. Wait, dude. is it three bucks a gallon or a liter? Gallon. Yeah. So it's yeah. cheaper than America. Yeah, it's a lot cheaper than, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. A lot yeah. cheaper than America. You know? <laughs> and, I mean, and actually, you guys are still paying a higher price. Yeah, a little bit higher. I, I, mean, I, guess, I guess it's expensive to deliver. It is expensive. I mean, because yeah. everything has to come through the border. I mean, yeah, every yeah, time yeah. you cross the border, even still, here you, know, it's you about, see a, a day's worth of trucks lined up. Yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Here's, here it's about 230 mm -hmm. if you do the conversion rate. Wow. And that's not bad. I mean, that's not bad. And the people, I mean, of course, the, uh, the taxis, I mean, since... 2014 prices have gone up at least 50%. You know, I mean, uh, a kilo of chicken breast used to be around 200 rubles yeah. per kilo. Mm -hmm. Now it's uh, 300 maybe. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some places, so even bucks. a little bit more than that. Yeah, yeah, but I mean, five bucks for two, two, two and a half pounds, pounds of, yeah. of chicken ain't that chicken yeah. breast yeah, ain't yeah. that bad, you know? No, I mean, no, 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 not compared to the and states. And if you, yeah. um, you know, if you go around to like the open air markets and stuff, you can get better deals than that. I mean, the prices have risen. The banks, the Russian banks, have not yet opened in uh, in DPR, but they're they they are in the process of doing so. Uh, we still have uh, different uh, internet and telephone providers there. Mm -hmm. The phone numbers in DPR are now in the process of being switched over to uh, plus seven well, instead yeah, the of the plus yeah, three eight. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, I mean, so it's it's a process, man. I mean, uh, we're witnessing. Uh, you know, a historic global political change here, you know, and so, you know, that kind of stuff doesn't happen right overnight. Yeah. Now, I've gotten a lot of messages from people maybe over the last, I don't know, few weeks. They're, they sort of ask me, Tim, how could I then go down and serve in the Donbass or serve in the Russian army? Because I hear that you could get citizenship by serving in the Russian army. Uh, first off, how realistic is that? Because like, for example, like with yourself, because you mm -hmm. actually did that, like, dude, like, I've lived here a long time. I think I speak Russian pretty darn well. A lot of times when people scream stuff from far away, it's not like they're screaming something in English. Mm -hmm. Or there's a little bit of a filter, you know what I mean? Like sure. well, between what people say and what they don't. Or what, Basically, how the hell do you fight in an army that speaks a different language? Um, well, and was, can people still even do that? Um, the chances of that are, are very, very close to zero. If, if you speak fluent Russian... If you have combat experience, you might be able to, and if you can get a visa and get into Russia, mm -hmm. you might be able to talk to Wagner and get a job there. Uh, mm -hmm. Maybe Wagner, yeah. yeah. But uh, I went to the recruiting office yeah. with a friend of mine. Yeah. I tried to sign up, and they said, sorry, no foreigners. Oh, uh, I see. So I mean, <laughs> even in the DPR, uh, it's been, you know, I mean, when I joined up in 2014, it was a totally, totally different deal back yeah, yeah. then. It was totally wild west. And, uh, yeah, it was. And, I mean, I didn't speak Russian hardly at all. Uh, I was 54 years old. I had, you know, mm -hmm. three years in the U.S. Army experience. Uh, had some pretty wild times down in Mexico. <laughs> and, uh, I mean, so I had some experience. But, I mean, I, I honestly didn't expect to live through the winter, you know. and. Yeah. Very, very close many times uh, to not living through the winter. But I did. And, uh, I mean, in the first days, it was really tough. I mean, at the front, I just had to basically operate on, you know, watching what the other guys did, kind of feeling the vibes, mm -hmm. um, you know. And then basically there was, uh, you know, just, uh, I mean, the guys, I mean, they helped me. 
But they also watched to see how fast I would pick things up. I mean, yeah. the first couple of days I was wearing my uh, my body armor backwards, you know, and they oh. they didn't say anything. <laughs> uh, they, they just watched to see how long until I figured it out. You know? <laughs> oh, well, uh, thankfully uh, that didn't become a critical issue. I'll put it that yeah, way. It works, so. it works well both <laughs> ways, you know. But, uh, yeah, so, um, uh, well, one thing is, again, is so, like, okay, they attack. Like, did you even understand, like, you know, that's like, I don't know, what do they even say? Mm-hmm. What, what is, what's, the, what's the command to, like, stand up and react? Well, I mean, uh, my first battle was the evening of the 1st of January, 2015. Mm-hmm. After dinner, we went and uh, hung out with the, uh, the, co- the position combat commander, and who's still a very good friend of mine to this day. Mm. And, uh, you know, we talked, smoked some cigarettes, and then he said, all right, давай, каска, бронек, автомат. Yeah, yeah. Пьянадцат <laughs> минутс. Uh-huh. You know, mm. на робота. Oh, yeah, you know, yeah, We'll yeah. get to work. And that was it, man. I mean, and so, uh, mm-hmm. and, I mean, I was up on the roof with this sniper. Uh, we were working on through a window. At this, we were at a monastery, actually a convent near yeah. the Donetsk airport. And uh, we were at this window, and, you know, there's maybe 50 U-crops 150 meters yeah. away in a green belt there shooting at us. And Sniper Latasha could get up and take a couple of shots, and he'd get down, and I'd get up with the off the mat. And, mm-hmm. and then, and, and dude, the Sniper, I mean, like, we were about this far apart, and a green tracer came through the window, like, just like that, dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and when, you know, you know yeah. when, when you see a tracer, yeah. it's one tracer and then yeah, three and like, or five. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah and yeah. so... You know, it was that close in my first battle, you know, but, you know, I, uh, you know, I won the respect of those guys by doing my job well, by being brave when it was time to be brave. And, uh, you know, that was like one of the proudest things I ever did, you know, was to, because to, mm-hmm. these guys, they were tough and they, they were real, real soldiers, real men and good guys, you know, and so, and I'm still friends with all of them. I've lost uh, a lot of friends in this war over these years. I, I lost a friend today uh, who was killed this morning. Uh, Ilya, he was a, uh, a volunteer from Italy. He was in mm-hmm. Spetsnaz, sniper, and then uh, he got he got killed today. Mm. Sorry to no. hear, bro. Oh, yeah, well, our condolences. Um, I guess maybe then the last question would be, um, from the Russian side, again, this is media versus reality. Because I work in the media, so I ask a lot of questions mm-hmm. from that sort of standpoint. Um, you know, they kind of have this image or this message to people on the, the Kiev forces, like, you guys are conscripted. We know you don't want to fight. Why don't you just surrender? But what you just just described, fighting from this convent, how, would, how does anyone even surrender? How do you get from one side of a front to another side of a front to surrender, especially when there's commissars or you're never mm-hmm. alone, or even if you were. So imagine you're like, okay, I'm gonna sneak out and I'm gonna surrender. You move, some guy sees an object moving in the middle of the night, bang. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's an excellent question. The Ukrainians, they do use their hardcore Nazis like Pravi Sector and Azov and uh, you know Dnieper, you know, the really super hardcore, mm-hmm. you know, psychopath killers. No. You know, kind of as blocking troops, and they they have shot their own troops that were trying to surrender. Mm-hmm. I mean, but the point now, it's a different war. Back then, all all the all our, all our battles were defensive. Mm-hmm. You know, it was always the Ukrops coming to attack us. Yeah. And um, now, the you know the shoe is on the other foot, and our guys are advancing. You know, and so and you see it. You know, the videos every day on the internet. Uh, People, uh, you know, these guys surrender. They get, you know, if they're wounded, they get taken care of. They're not getting tortured. They're not getting castrated. They're not getting murdered like the Ukrops have done to our guys. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I mean, you know, and a lot of them are getting traded back again. You know, Uh, there was just another uh, 110 for 100. I mean, Mm -hmm. at least today the the prisoner exchange was one for one. You know, I mean, the one that they did before with the— uh, Medvedev, uh, whatever his name was. Uh, Medvedchuk. Yeah, Medvedchuk and uh, a bunch of the Azov guys they let go. You know, that that was a hard blow to the morale of our soldiers and our yeah, people. Kadyrov you know. didn't like it. I'll talk about well, that Well, I mean, a lot of people didn't <laughs> yeah. like that, you know. So, I mean, at least they've probably learned the lesson now about not letting the Nazis and the war criminals go and making it one for one, you know. Mm-hmm. And so that's, that's a good thing, you know. And, I mean, 
All the all the all the conscripts have to do now is survive till our, our guys get there. Show a white flag, raise their hands, hmm. and uh, it's over. And they'll live. You know, yeah. they'll live. I mean, we're not going to torture them. We're not going to murder them. And eventually, they'll be able to go home to their families. You know, I mean, the Ukrainian and Russian are one people. You know, mm-hmm. and this I've said it for the whole time. This is not a war between Ukraine and Russia or a Ukrainian civil war. This is a war of Nazis against the good people of the world. And Russia is the hope for the future future of humanity right now. Yeah. And so, I mean, everybody, all good people in the West need to understand this: Russia is not your enemy. Your enemy is the people who own and control your government. Your media companies. And your media companies. Social and media. That, you know, yeah. And the time for talking is over. The time for voting is over. You know, only idiots vote for anybody in the United States or Europe anymore. I mean, it's completely rigged. And the people yeah. that, they, that you have the choice between are all absolutely corrupt. So, I mean, you know, take the uh, example of... You know, like the yellow vests in France, you know, I mean, there's people in the streets of every Western country, you know, from from Moldova to, you know, to England and stuff Mm. like that. And that's what they need to do. They need to do more than just talk right now. Yeah, yeah. There's like over, I think it used to be 40,000, then 50,000. Now the report is 70,000 people protesting in Moldova. I think there's 2 million people in Moldova. So that's a lot. Yeah. Yeah. It's uh, it might be the first sort of color revolution that isn't pro Western if they sort of get organized because the numbers just keep growing, but that's a that's a story for another day. Anyways, I want to thank you for coming right. to Moscow and giving me your time, and I want to thank you for giving me your time and your studio, my friend. Ah, no so right. high quality today, thanks to John. So anyways, Russell, Texas Bentley, John, Mark Dugan, and Tim Kirby signing out. Davai. So anyways, guys, if you enjoyed this video and you like the opinions coming out of my big fat mouth, then uh, join up on my Telegram channel. That's Tim Kirby Hardcore on Telegram. Link, of course, in the description.